Hey everybody, I'm Mike, and this is a presentation on time management, right? We're gonna focus on this mostly in terms of creatives, freelancers, solo entrepreneurs, but this is useful and applicable to anyone and everybody, whether you work your standard corporate job or you just wanna find some better ways to manage your time at home with family. Um, I'm going to be walking through all of that stuff today. Uh, the key reason I'm doing this recording is because I actually already gave this presentation a little while ago uh, in front of a group of local creatives in the Atlanta metro area for uh, Rising Tide Society or Tuesdays Together, they also go by, um, and got a lot of really fantastic feedback from there. Um, a lot of people came up to me afterwards saying, this was wonderful, this was amazing, when are you posting this recording? To which I said, oh, we did this as an Instagram Live. Problem was... Forgot to save it, or tried to save it, didn't know how to, and it went bye-bye into the cyber ether. So that's why we're doing this recording today. And the other big reason I'm doing this recording is because there were a couple things that naturally I forgot to say, but there were also some answers I gave that after I thought about them some more were wrong um, or could have been better. So I want to make sure I get those items addressed appropriately. I want to make sure that I cover everything I need to. And um, that I help more people master time management um, because it is something that I find is essential to going through life to make yourself happy, to get yourself to be productive, and also to find good work-life balance um, and setting those boundaries. Um, those are all very important things to me, and I want to share my knowledge, my experience with you guys so you get something out of this. Um, yeah, so this format, um, I've got the presentation up here, so you'll see me go back and forth um, as a quick note. I'm very quirky, I'm very sarcastic, um, so I will do a couple of asides where I'm looking this way, and they will probably be totally rambunctious and ridiculous, so be warned. Yeah? Okay. Let's dig in. Let's get started. Alrighty, so here we are, time management. How to work effective hours so you can enjoy life outside of your business. Again, we're focusing mostly on uh, freelancers and solo entrepreneurs, but again, this is applicable to anybody, um, whether you be, pardon me, uh, you know, nine to five office job or uh, this is just applicable towards your family. All right. So first things first. Hi, I'm Mike. Um, I'm this weirdo. Uh, as you can see, I've got a very, very diverse background. Um, I'm a biomedical engineering by training. I went to Georgia Tech, graduated in 2012 so that I could get a job designing novel medical devices. Uh, my background, I've designed spinal implants, biopsy pens, disinfectant floor mats, wheelchairs, manifolds for surgical vacuums, automated pill dispensers, fecal matter transplant devices, which was modeled, I kid you not, after a French press. So yes, I made a French press for poop. That's a fun story if you ever wanna hear about it. Just ask. I'm happy to share. It's really funny. Um, and then finally, what I'm working on today is I'm developing with Here's a... Here's what I found. Well, that wasn't good. Thank you, Siri. <sighs> Time management, everybody, includes putting your technology on Do Not Disturb. Anyways, getting back into this. Um, right, so my current project is... Uh, with my amazing team, we're developing a autism diagnostic device, which is really, really powerful. It's really cool. Incredibly excited about it. But anyways, so as part of my day job as an engineer, um, I'm always balancing multiple projects at once. I'm working with multiple vendors. And because it's a medical device that's safe but very complicated, um, we create a, fo a phone book worth of documents probably every other month. And that's on our slow times when we're like at certain key points in our uh, process that'll be generated in about a day. So it's fun stuff. And of course this totals about 40 hours per week, um, that I'm working. All right. And now on top of all of that, I'm an editorial and brand portrait photographer. Um, I have a background in shooting weddings. I did that for about six years and I'm transitioning to portrait work. Um, mostly because it's a little bit slower paced. I get to have more control. It's not as hectic as a wedding day. Uh, and it gives me the opportunity to do more of the things that I want to do. Um, so that's why I'm going there. And anyways, that tangent aside. So for that gig, I do about 12 to 16 hours per week um, business days working on the business, right, of my photography gig. So that's editing, marketing, social media, blogging, all that stuff. And then I average anywhere from one to four hours on the weekends actually shooting. 
okay? Not including um, Saturdays, which are reserved for college football. Go Jackets. So that's who I am, and I have found some crazy way to make all of this work together um, because I spent a lot of time working on time management. I'm going to go this way. Um, by working on time management, I mean figuring out ways to make my hours productive, efficient, and just I don't waste time. And part of that is creating strong boundaries, setting the right um, expectations. Um, and that's what I want to share with you guys because I do all these things and I still – and while, okay, I have a strong uh, family, friendship, base, all those kind of things, I still get to go out and have fun and do things um, – because that's one of my core values, which we're going to get into, is how you value your time and how you're scheduling for that. So this is my background. This is why I think I'm qualified to give this talk. Um, yeah, so let's dive back in. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is define time management. What is it? What do we think it is? Um, when I did this lecture, I got I asked the group or the audience, whatever you want to call them, and the responses I got were, you know, just – being productive, being efficient, um, prioritizing tasks, um, all genuinely or generally correct things. Um, but if we do a quick Google search, we'll find that it's the ability to use one's time effectively or productively, especially at work. Okay. That especially at work thing kind of hit me, um, in a weird way because yes, we want to be good at managing our time at work, but to live happy and full lives, we have to be good at managing our time across all aspects of our day, across all aspects of our life. So that includes our home life um, with our friends, our family, um, you name it, the whole bunch. So there's that, but I have a slightly different definition, and it's organizing and achieving your task list in order of value priority, okay? And by this nerd, I mean this guy right here. Um so value priority, that's the key to what how I do time management. It's um, We're going to get into what these values are consisted of, but that's what I go after, right? So this isn't going to be, you know, the silver bullet like, you know, do these things and everything magically works. Like, no, this is something that you have to come up with that's um, unique to you as a person, as a business, as a family member, okay? So let's dig in. So first things first, why is time management difficult? Squirrel. Squirrel. Um, we've got so many distractions, right? Okay, so the squirrel effect. We've got smartphones, social media, games, text messaging, never-ending notifications, okay? I mean, we're constantly living in our phones, doing Facebook, Instagram. <sighs> Darn mouse. Sorry about that. Uh, games. I mean, just this technology that we have in our hands right here is wonderful, but it also has a lot of negative effects on how we handle our lives um, and what we do with them. So it's double-edged sword. And it makes concentrating difficult on one particular task. So next, we have TV, right? Um, TV used to be that... I'm going to go here. TV used to be that the TV itself was a big box. It was in the living room. It was in the TV room. And then you had your office over here. And you couldn't make them commingle. You couldn't bring work to a TV or you couldn't bring TV to your work. I mean, you could, but it was difficult, right? Because they were these big physical boxes that just did not move. Well, now we've got laptops and we've got streaming services. We have videos, movies, episodes, anything you want on Netflix, on Hulu, on Amazon. That's just right there available on our second monitor. So we're constantly being able to watch TV and there's all this content anytime we want, anywhere we want. So we're, you know, combining and confusing where, what environments are dedicated to work and what environments are dedicated to life and home. Okay. Oh, here's the biggest offender, email. Um, a recent study was done where they said about, I don't know, eight to 10 hours. No, it was 2.5 hours per day are wasted on email. 2.5, okay? If your average workday is eight hours, that's insane, okay? Especially when you combine that with meetings, grabbing lunch or working through lunch, depends on what you do. But like, that's the majority of your day. You can't get anything done. And most emails are actually useless because 
everyone's, you know, endlessly, like, replying, oh, BCC, CC, all that, like, there's a lot of waste in email. And we have this really bad habit of saying, oh, email, what? And your, you know, your attention turns immediately, and you got to answer it. You got to be right on top of it. There's a big push for always being in the know, in the moment, always present with what's going on, because you can't miss out. We all fear or suffer from FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. We need to step away from that, okay? So that's why this is difficult. All right, next, rise and grind culture, okay? It's the never stop hustling, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk. Brilliant, incredible uh, entrepreneur, thought leader person. Um, But he's very big on saying, you know, you should be hustling from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed and you should be pushing those hours so you can constantly keep on doing the things. I don't necessarily disagree with that, but you have to have a life. You have to have separation from this. You can't just be work all the time, right? When's the time for you to hang out with your family? So I have a problem with rise and grind. I have a problem with don't stop the hustle because as a culture, as a community, especially in the United States, we are now confusing busy with productive, right? Let me ask you, how many times has somebody asked you, oh, how are things going? You're like, oh my gosh, I am so busy. I've got so much going on. When in reality, your tasks are just taking up all of your time. But if you sat down and knocked them out, one, two, three, you'd have the rest of your day open. That's the difference between productive and busy, right? Someone can tell me, I worked 12 hours today. That means nothing to me. I want to know what you got done. Because that's really what matters. Not how long it took you to do it, what you got done. Okay? So, anyways, back to Rise and Grind. We've got internet personalities that say you can't stop. You have to keep going. This is going back to Gary Vaynerchuk and so many other people that, while brilliant and are mostly correct, you have this group of people who are saying that, you know, you should always be working. And that's just not true. And that's not right. Um, Next, we have day jobs, culture, and technology allowing for remote work. Remote work is an incredibly liberating thing that eliminates the ability or the need to commute to an office, to have office space, to require everybody to be in the same place at the same time. It's wonderful. The issue with this, though, is that now we can't separate work from home. We are now expected to be on call, to be available to our jobs all hours of the day, which is really not okay. You know, we should not be slaves to the job. We should be able to separate, I'm at work. From when I'm home. And then next, and this kind of ties into is that freelancers can make their own schedules. This is a blessing and a curse. Now you can work mornings. You can work evenings. You can work, you know, some hours in the morning, some hours in the afternoon, some hours at one o'clock in the morning, whatever fits what you do. But the issue with this is that now, because we are in charge of our own schedule, we are in charge of ourselves. And when things get done, we're always working on it. There's, It's a very hard to say... I'm leaving this at home, especially when you're working from home and you make your own schedule and work is home, right? That's why it's difficult to separate. And then finally, social media pressure. This kind of goes back to the internet personalities in that, you know, we see these Instagram feeds, these Pinterest feeds where everyone's saying, oh my gosh, look at all the things I'm doing. Look at all this awesome stuff that's happening. And we have this inner mindset that says, I have to keep going. I have to keep working. I can't stop. I have to, have to, have to go, 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 go. No, you don't. You really don't. I want to show you how. Okay? The next thing. Why is this difficult? Serve your customers has become I have no boundaries. Especially in the freelance world right now, there is this really big push to always be available to your clients, always to do the best you can to like be there for them, do what they ask, like provide a wonderful client experience. And you absolutely should. There's no reason you shouldn't issue here is that we have now allowed ourselves to let our clients walk all over us. They're calling us at odd hours. They're asking for things that are outside the scope of work. They're infringing or on our day-to-day like not work lives. That's not okay. So how do we change this? What does it require to alleviate these things, to get in control of our schedule, and to better manage our time so that we are productive instead of busy. 
it requires a change in mindset, okay? Again, not a silver bullet. This isn't just like, oh, do this and everything's fixed. No, you have to change your mindset. And as we know, changing your mindset is not easy. It's a daily thing. It's never ending, but it's worth it, all right? So here are some mindset shifts that we're going to walk through. Number one, no, you really can't do all the things. Also, thank you, Lauren, for helping out with this picture. Um, if you'll notice, she's got a lot of coffee hanging out right there. Um, I asked her how long it would take to assemble those cups. She said, like, two days. One of those is mine. Of the, like, six. Yeah. But, anyways, no, you really can't do all the things. And by that, I mean you can't do all your social media. Do all your blog posting. Do the work for your client. Do all the client consults. Work on your website. Write the copy for your website. Take all the pictures needed for your website. Go home. Make dinner. Be there with your family. Take care of your kids. Take care of your pets. Like, you cannot do all of that. You have to be willing to delegate. Okay? Next. And here's a fun one. Have to versus want to. Okay? I want to challenge everyone to reframe haves to wants, okay? Because let's think about this for a second. When I say I have to do something, it's boring. It's a chore. It's annoying. I have to go to the store. I have to do laundry. I have to write this blog post. I have to set up my social media feed. I have to go have this meeting with this really annoying client. Like, have to sucks, okay? It immediately puts you in a mindset where you don't want to be there. You don't want to do it. There's stress. There's agony. It just puts you in a really crappy place, Okay, so instead of us saying, I have to do something, let's make it, I want to do something. Because I want to is exciting, it's fun, and it's an achievement. I want to go to work today, even on Monday. I want to have this client meeting. I want to go on this photo shoot. I want to write this blog post. Like, when you frame it like that, it's so much easier to be excited to attack your task list, to want to go after that big, jagunda like crazy, scary thing that's on your you know list that you've been putting off for months, right? I want to versus I have to really makes a difference in terms of how you approach things and why you want to do it. It really helps get you motivated to do the things you got to do, okay? Next. True time management is prioritizing values, okay? A little on the nose here, the picture I have here is a picture of family, okay? This is my buddy Ty, um, and he paid for a photo shoot to celebrate his mom's 50th birthday party. Yes, one mom, five boys, absolutely crazy, and yeah, she's 50. Mind blown, okay? Where are your secrets, lady, for how to stay so young, so good? Shelly's incredible. But anyways, so it's me it's prioritizing your values, okay? It's not just saying like I'm prioritizing email or I'm prioritizing this project or I'm prior prioritizing whatever things. No, it's saying I prioritize my family. I prioritize my work. I prioritize so many different things and that's how you truly define what matters to you, and then that really unlocks how you manage your time, okay? Thinking beyond the spreadsheet of tasks and going beyond that to what matters to me on a human level. So that's the question. What do you value? What, what matters to you, okay? When I gave this presentation, I did an entire poll um, gave everyone about two minutes to talk with people around them to talk about what they value, right? To kind of go back and forth. And after those two minutes, I asked for some examples. And the answers I got were pretty good. You know, they were basically spot on. It was faith, family, um, time with their kids, sleep, um, time to learn, um, time for creative expression. I mean, really important things. Health, right? That one should always be up there, including family and faith, if that's your thing as well. So, it's all things that we know are important to us, but we're not setting up appropriately. So let's figure that out, okay? So what do we value? So I'm gonna be very transparent here and I'm gonna share what I value, okay? And then we're gonna look at my calendar a little bit later so you can see how that works. 
So here are my values. Convenience. I'm a nut about convenience, okay? I have a charging cable connected to a USB in my bedroom, in my laptop bag, in my living room, and in my car, okay? I have a charging cable for my watch next to my bed and in my laptop bag. I do Freshly, which is a meal prep style service where they deliver six prepared meals every single week. Why? It's not because I don't love cooking. I love cooking. I think it's fantastic. It's incredibly gratifying. It's a very, very fun experience that I really enjoy. But that's in 30 minutes to an hour of cooking. It's 30 minutes to an hour of cleanup. And for me, I'd rather spend that time with friends and family or knocking out my photography business because that's what I value. So I value convenience, right? Taking care of things that are mundane that I don't have to do and I have to worry about so that I can be productive with my time. Okay, next, time to learn and create. This is really big to me, okay? I love the time to just do the work, to learn new things. I'm a huge book nerd, okay? I reserve... 30 to 40 minutes every single night to read a chapter of a book, okay? Whether it be human psychology, communication, mindset, you know, figuring out why people do what they do, how they operate, why we make certain decisions. Um, To me, it's fascinating, okay? And also the occasional murder mystery or I'll reread Jurassic Park or Harry Potter for the bajillionth time because, hello, nerd. So that's stuff that I really prioritize, okay? And then being present with friends and family, present with friends and family. Okay, let's define presence here for a second, okay? Being present with friends and family is not just saying, yes, I'm having dinner with everybody, but I'm stuck looking at my phone the entire time. No, okay? Being present is having genuine conversation, genuine connection with people, okay? That is what matters to me, right? So if I'm constantly thinking about work, if I can't escape my office or the task list that is my job, I can't be there truly, genuinely with my friends and family. And that's not okay for me. Okay? I want to be there with them. That's my value. And then finally, because I'm a nerd, sleep, aka mental health. What this means is I really, really, really want to make sure that I am my optimal self every single day, okay? Sleep is the one thing that you cannot catch up on. There's no medication to replenish sleep. You just either get sleep or you don't. And I'm sure you're fully aware of the difference in how your body operates, how your mind operates when you don't get a good night's sleep before that, okay? I am notorious for pissing off my friends and family because I prioritize my sleep schedule, okay? It'll be... Friday night, 9.30, like, hey, man, let's go get drinks. Let's go do all these things. I'm going, nah, man, it's almost 10. I got to go to bed. And they're like, what's wrong with you, dude? You're in your 20s. It's Friday night. I'm like, yeah, I have a photo shoot at 9 a.m. I need to be my best self for the next day, right? Prioritize the things that matter to you, okay? And also, sleep is just really good for you in terms of, like, health, not getting sick, mental health, so many things. Like sleep is like the core for everything you do to get better. Um, And I would wrap this up into health overall. So like exercise, eating right, all those things, right? So those are my values, right? Those are like my top four values, okay? So fun question. How do you know what somebody else values, right? What are two things that will tell you what they value? Any guesses? It's their schedule and how they choose to spend their money, okay? One of the biggest things that I've recently learned is that, and I'm sure lots of us are guilty of this, is you'll see someone who spent money lavishly on one particular thing, and you're like, I don't get that. That makes no sense. Why would you do that? And that's wrong because all that is is just a case of, My values are different than their values. It doesn't mean their values are wrong. It doesn't mean my values are right. It just means they're different. So when I see someone spending money on a particular thing that I may not agree with, it's just that's what they value. That's what they choose to value. And that's fine. That's great. Good for them. That's amazing. So that's what I mean by value sometimes, okay? But that's a separate note. But if you look at how someone schedules their time and how they spend their money, it tells a great deal about what they value. And here's another fun point about this. 
your actions genuinely equal your values. So if you're ever in a funk and you don't feel like you're doing the right thing and you're like feeling out of whack, chances are your actions are not aligning with your values. I know personally for me that if I don't take pictures for two weeks, I literally get shakes. I get anxious. I get nervous, okay? I have to pick up a camera. I have to shoot something because that's part of my value is that creative expression, that creative activity. That matters to me, right? If you're doing things that don't align with your values, you're going to feel it. It's going to make you anxious. It's going to make you nervous. It's going to make you feel terrible. So figuring out your values and building your schedule and your life around those values will make you a better and happier person. All right. So next mindset shift. Say that 10 times fast and you're bound to say something really dirty really fast. Anyways, boundaries are everything. Yes, they are everything. You have to protect your time and the things you value. Okay, that's what I was just talking about. If you value time with your family, set up your schedule to have time with your family and don't let anyone get in the way of that. Set your boundaries. You, Some people are going to call you rude. Some call, people are going to call you like ridiculous. But no, that's your value. If you value something, make time for it. It's as simple as that. And also make boundaries to protect it. So that you get to have it. So you get to enjoy your values. So you get to do your values. Because again, actions are values. All right? And one of my favorite mindset shifts, you run your business, not your clients. Quit being a doormat. Stop it. Stop. 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 Don't do it. Okay? Don't. This goes back to boundaries. Don't let your clients tell you or force you to change the way you handle your business, okay? You set up your business. You run your business. That's why you're doing this, okay? It's your business. You set the hours. You set the communication. You set the expectations, not your clients, okay? You don't have to feel guilty for your clients saying, why aren't you available at 10 a.m.? Why do you open at 11? Because that's when I decide to open every day. That's my schedule. That's my that's my business. I would choose to run it. Okay, how often as a consumer do you ever truly get pissed at a company when you're like, oh my gosh, why are you not open at 10 p.m. tonight? Okay, fine, I guess I'll call you at 9 a.m. tomorrow. It's not that big a deal. They can wait. The world will not end if you don't respond within 30 seconds. Okay? All right, well, usually this is where I would ask questions, but because this is a recording... We're not going to have it. So if I remember correctly from uh, the presentation, I didn't have a lot of questions at this point. Um, everybody was pretty on par with everything, so I'm going to move forward with this. Um, there is another question slide later on where people did have questions, and that's where I'll dig into those. All right? So we're going to keep moving. Actually, first, tea time. <sighs> I love English breakfast. Okay. One more. Hit the spot. All right, let's keep going. Next, time management myths. This is my favorite. All right, so what is something that everybody claims is the means to tackle multiple things at once? Multitasking. Actually, multitasking is crap. It's not real. It doesn't work. It's false. Okay, let me rephrase that. There are two types of multitasking. Um, we're going to tackle the one that most everyone thinks of, that most everyone practices, and fails at miserably because it's horrible. Okay. Here's how we're going to debunk multitasking. Let's say that you have three tasks that are independently assigned simultaneously with the same due date. I know that's a mouthful. Some of us really hated word problems in math, so let me try and do layman's terms. You are given three tasks. They are given to you on the same day, and they all have the same due date, and they all take roughly the same amount of time to complete, okay? For background, this is a lesson that I learned from one of my engineering jobs previously, where my sales manager had three separate clients, 
and said, yes, Mike can do all of this. Gave me each task. And so I asked, when is this due? And they said, oh, you know, this date. And I'm like, well, which one? All of them. That was not going to happen. Which means I worked overtime. There goes my values because somebody else didn't understand how it worked. But anyways, let's show why it doesn't work. Because I tried multitasking and it didn't work. All right, so here are these three items, right? Let's say we tackle them sequentially, right? So one after the other. One, two, three. One task finishes on time, which is the original due date. The other task finished way behind schedule. It's just naturally what happens because there's just not enough time in the day, whether it's either you don't have the resources to complete it or you don't have the time to complete it. One of those two things. Now, let's say we multitask, which is essentially working short periods on multiple items. We break it up, okay? So here are halves of each one. Here's the original due date for all three. So now nothing gets completed on time. As we can see, here's the rest. And oh, by the way, it takes twice as long to complete any task, right? So here's the theoretical multitasking completion date for all three. But wait, it gets worse. What really happens is we restart multiple times and inefficiently at that, we experience switching loss, okay? That's what these little gray bars are in between each of these tasks, okay? Switching loss is your brain going between different activities, okay? It ends up taking as much time as a single task. It's money down the drain and time wasted. Why are you wasting time and money? Why would you want to do that consciously? You don't. You want to go home. You want to spend time with your family. You want to go home and play video games. You want to go home and just not do the thing. Switching loss is terrible, okay? To put this into context in case you don't know what I'm talking about, let's do an example here. Okay, I'm working on a blog post. Um, working on the thing, working on the thing, working on the thing. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay, so I got uh, this happened. Here's the story. Here's the line. Da, 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 da. Oh, hey, look, email. Oh, shoot. Um, okay, what, what do they need? Um, need a, the I don't know where the freaking venue. Um, oh, shoot. Okay. Eh, next screen. Uh, research, research, research. Da, 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 da. 20 minutes later. Okay. Uh, email drafted. Everything looks good. Proofread. Yeah. Okay, cool. Done. Blog post. Oh, crap. Where was I? Um, Let's see. Okay, reread it. Reread. Uh, Go back through. I was, I was doing this. I did that. Okay. okay, that's where I was. Okay, and then, shoot, what was I going to say next? Um, What, what, what was happening? We, we were going to do the thing, and then, like, that, that happened, and then, like, how much time did I just waste? It's not just the 20 minutes of doing the other activity that you took away from the previous activity. It's the time it takes for your brain to change gears and go from one item to another. It's a waste. It is an absolute waste. Assign blocks of time to specific like activities. Focus on one task and knock it out. And here's the key thing, is that if you get three items assigned at the same time, you need to communicate properly and set client expectations. Okay? I tell my clients for photos, Yes, I usually have these done pretty quickly, but I've got a lot on my plate right now, so don't expect them for three to four weeks to get your pictures back, okay? I tell them that right off the bat, because if I tell them it's going to take two weeks and it turns into three, they get angry. Don't do that. I'd rather pad my schedule a little bit, finish early, and make them happy or extra happy, okay? So here's the thing. Here's the version of multitasking that does work. It's... Performing one active task while other passive tasks work in the background. Okay, so an example of this is reviewing email while images render, right? So as a photographer, um, I'll take three, 4,000 photos at a wedding. And obviously, I'm only going to deliver eh, like six, 700, something like that. Um, so, you know, after I've gone through all the images, like reduce the blanks, reduce the duplicates, reduce just the bad ones, it happens, okay? We're not perfect. Um, that's any wedding photographer, not just me, okay? Um, I then send it to over to my photo editing software. It now takes time for that stuff to upload and then resolve the files. I can't do anything to make that faster. Like, 
That's just physics. That's my computer, RAM, hard drive, all that doing the job, okay? I can't make that go any faster. So while that's working in the background, it's a passive task now that's just doing its own thing. Well, now I'll just go answer email because that's active and I don't have to actively work on the images rendering in my photo editing software, okay? So that's multitasking in my mind, right? It's working on one thing actively while other passive tasks are tackled in the background, okay? That's what multitasking is, if you're going to define it. Otherwise, uh-uh, no, don't do it. Okay, so now that we've tackled myths, we've tackled mindset shifts, let's go into good time management practices, all right? Sorry, I need more tea. Hmm. Wonderful. Okay, work environment. Uh, basically, a crap work environment means crap work, a.k.a. garbage in equals garbage out. Mm -hmm. I learned this from my engineering job. I love this saying, garbage in equals garbage out. It's perfect. It totally aligns. Basically, what this comes down to is that if you're in a coffee shop and there's a kid screaming, trying to, you know, compete with a world-famous opera singer, those are not good work hours. It's going to suck. You're not going to get anything good out of it, okay? Your work product is going to be equivalent to your work environment conditions. Find a place where it's optimal for you to work, okay? If you're just typing emails and it's okay that you're a little, like, frazzled at the kids screaming, then that's fine. But if you need to work on something that requires intense concentration and a lot of focus, find an environment that lets you work without distraction, okay? Next deadlines yay that's only a little sarcastic just a little okay we fill the time available to complete tasks all right what that means is if we don't say hey this has a due date it's just never going to get done but there's another level to that okay tell me if this sounds familiar i'll do that next week versus I'll do it Monday the 7th at 5 p.m. Guess which one you'll actually do. It's easy to push off a vague date. It's really difficult to push off a specific deadline, okay? This is why New Year's resolutions for weight loss and the gym never happen, okay? You can't do, oh, next year I'm going to go to the gym. Well, when? Because technically you could do it any 365 days of the next year. No. If you say, I'm going to the gym Monday, January 3rd at 2 p.m., it's really hard to break that commitment. Okay? That's why we have doctor's appointments. That's why we have everything's based on calendars where it's a fixed amount of time and period. Okay? You don't show up willy-nilly. You have a plan. Set a deadline. Okay. The other benefit to this is that it keeps you accountable, okay? If, especially if you're working for yourself as a solo entrepreneur or a freelancer. If you don't give yourself deadlines, you'll push stuff out, you'll let it slide, and it's just not a good end result, okay? You want to give yourself goals to achieve so that you actually hit things on time, right? And me personally, I'll usually set my deadlines like a, a little bit before when they're actually due. Um, so it gives me some wiggle room in case something happens and I need a little more time to work on it. I can, and it doesn't affect um, the de final deliverable in terms of my client goes. Okay, now, pause, sidebar. This is a fun one. Okay. Sorry, my foot just got a cramp. Ow! Mm. Okay, while well, that's happening. So, <laughs> there's this fun thing about procrastination. I'm hesitant to give this permission, but there was a study done that I can't remember the author for the life of me. I read it through uh, Trello, um, one of the uh, time management task management apps. And basically what the research said was that giving yourself a little bit of that scare, that push to get things done um, is a good thing. So what I mean by that is, say you, so for instance, I'm a photographer, right? I know that um, I told my client that the photos are due in two weeks. 
instead of giving my saying I'm going to start it, you know, tomorrow, I'm going to start it five days before they're due, okay? It's plenty of time to actually get it done. I'm not waiting until the 11th hour to actually do it, but it's close enough to the deadline where I'm sweating a little bit. I'm getting a little bit nervous. I'm going, oh man, I really got to get on this. Ah." That little bit of anxiety is actually good for you and will make you produce better work. It's really mind-blowing. It's kind of counter, in, counterproductive, counterintuitive. Both of those? Yes, no, maybe, I don't know. But it's a thing. Be careful, okay? This is like, use that power responsibly. Um, I'd rather just knock it out early. But if you need that little bit of a push, you can put it kind of close to the deadline. Just be careful, okay? Major disclaimer on this one. I'm not at fault if you F this up. Okay. Um, right. So moving on. Um, working hours. Yay. Wait a second. I became a solo entrepreneur to avoid that nine to five crap. What are you talking about, Mike? So what this is, is that it forces you to have a balanced life. I'm not telling you specifically to work for work nine to five, like you're working at a corporate job, if that's why you got out of corporate life. But you need working hours so you can separate work from home. Okay, that's the key here. I'm not saying like you have to give yourself like a rigid office hours, da, 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 although I kind of do suggest that. It's more so that I want you to have a balanced life. I want you to have time where you're at work and time when you're at home. Okay, again, this is going back to what do you value? Okay, if all you value is work, fine, work all the time. I don't care. But if you value friends, family, exercise, health, going to see movies, going to see concerts, you have to schedule your working hours so that you can do those other things, okay? The other benefit, you're no longer a doormat for your clients. Oh, yes. Yes. What do we mean by being a doormat for your clients? I mean, if you don't have working hours, your clients will email you at 11 p.m., and if you don't respond, they will be angry because the expectation is that you will respond, I don't want to respond at 11 p.m. I want to go to bed. I want to read a book. I want to sleep. Okay? In my contracts, on my website, on my email signature, I have my working hours. Okay? They are explicitly 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. for my photography job. Okay? For my corporate engineering job, it's 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Okay? But it's 3 to 8 for my photography gig. Okay? My clients know... I will not respond outside of those hours. If I do, kudos for them. But typically, I don't. Okay? Set the expectation. Set your boundaries. Set your schedule for your values. Okay? All right, next. Pick your productive hours. Okay? Again, you're a freelancer. You can work whenever you want. Right? That means if you're a morning person and you're super productive in the morning... Work in the morning and then have the rest of the day do whatever you want, okay? I get to my engineering job at 7 a.m., okay? The reason I do this is because, number one, I need more time to work on my photography stuff at home. But two is that nobody else in the office gets in until like 9, 9.30, which means I have a full two hours to knock out the most difficult task on my list, It's a good work environment because it's quiet. There's no distractions. And no one's in the office to distract me. Get it done, okay? I work with a very social bunch of engineers, which I know is kind of against the stereotype, but we're actually kind of cool. And, you know, when everyone comes in the office, we're very chatty. We do a lot of ad hoc talks and meetings and whatnot, which is great. We're actually very productive with it. We get a lot of incredible work done. Um, This is for that autism device project. But... There are times in the middle of the day where I've had to shut my office door and say, guys, I got to do my thing, okay? That's why I get to work early, so I can use those first couple of hours to just not have the distractions, not have anything blocking me, and I can just get to work, okay? Working hours, okay? Now, one thing I'll add to this is that if you do work in teams like me um, and you have remote work or you have people who come in at different times, um, one thing I do suggest is having kind of like core hours. Um, 
if you have work that requires multiple people's input simultaneously. Um, so like I get in at seven, I leave at three, but there are other people in the office who get in at nine and leave at five. That's all fine. Cause we still have like that course of hours of nine to three where that's where the meetings are scheduled. That's where the bulk of like work that requires other people is scheduled. Okay. But those other floating hours before or after you're not responsible for meetings and whatnot. Like that's when you can just do your work. So that's how we tackle that. And I find it's really helpful. Okay. But again, pick your productive hours. Also, it helps reduce burnout, okay? It's really nice to be able to say, you know what? It's 3 p.m. I'm done. I don't have to work on on this anymore. I can go enjoy home, my other values, the things that matter to me. And it'll be there when I come back to work tomorrow. Okay? If you sit on something for hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks, it's going to burn you out. Okay? Working hours require you to have that break okay which is really good sorry i have a cold okay next getting automated okay let's talk about doing automated tasks okay that's using apps like zapier or zapier and then if this then that or i f t t t i feel like that could be a song somewhere i f t t t or no I and F and T T T. That is what it means to I stop it. Okay, so anyways, the point of these apps is that they connect different apps and services that typically have no relation to each other and help them like do data transfer or perform activities automatically, which is really handy. So like for me on my website, I have it set up that if anyone inquires through my website, like fills out the submission form saying, I want to work with you, Mike. Yes, please. Um they not only go through my workflow for become a client, they also get automatically added to a segment of an email list so I can send them emails that'll help them make better decisions to pick their photographer. Whether or not it's me, but I just I provide that email sequence of tips. So that information is automatically transferred over to this service. Uh, I use MailerLite, right? And Zapier is just the mechanism that connects the dots and sends that information. And you can do these with a lot of other things. So you can have uh, any clients that automatically, you know, inquire, like you can create a Google sheet so all their contact information, you can automatically add them to your Google voice uh, contact list, you can set up an automation so that when you leave your office, the thermostat at your home automatically drops so it's cool when you arrive. All kinds of crazy possibilities. Um, You can have... um, when you post something to Instagram with a his specific hashtag, it automatically goes to a specific Pinterest board. Um, again, you can do a lot of really crazy and cool things. So it's just take the time to research it, look into it, and find little tricks that just or little things that r- do it for you, so you don't have to actively do these yourselves. Because if you automate a lot of these little tasks, it ends up becoming much bigger chunks later on in the day that now allow you to do stuff that requires active, true input and thought, okay? Next, this one's one of my favorites, is social, 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 social media schedulers. What these are are apps like Later, Planoly, Tailwind. All they do is just schedule your social media posts and these apps post them for you. So essentially, like, I can sit down on a Monday, write out, you know, the caption for the Instagram post, the hashtags that go with it. I can tag whoever I want to. I can do all kinds of things. And I can say, great, schedule it for Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Okay. So at Wednesday, 1.30 p.m., when I'm looking at my phone, I don't see, hey, dummy, you should post something. I'm seeing, oh, so-and-so liked your post. Oh, someone left a comment. Oh, someone sent you a DM inquiring to work with you. It's the little things that save time like that. Um, and a lot of these are really good. I know, I think Tailwind and I think Buffer uh, link to Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And I think Buffer also does LinkedIn um, if you're on that platform. So it's really handy. And again, it's nice because you can automatically set like when the posts will get scheduled. So like I have reserve spots on mine for like Tuesday at 1 p.m., Wednesday at 8 a.m., Thursday at 5 p.m. So I can, on Monday, 
bulk schedule on my post so I can say, okay, got this one posted, send it off. It automatically gets linked to Tuesday at 1 p.m. Type of the next one, yeah, post this one. It automatically goes to Wednesday at 8 a.m. Get ready, type up the next one, send it, boom, it automatically goes to Thursday at 5 p.m. So that's really nice, okay? So you're not manually dragging and dropping. So if you do your analytics and you know the best times for people um, to interact with your content, to always see your social media posts, you can set these, um, I'll call it placeholder schedulers, um, so that when you're scheduling your post, they automatically go to those slots where you know you have the most engagement, okay? It's really handy and it does save you a lot of time. All right, next thing for getting automated, appointment schedulers. Oh my gosh, this is truly the greatest thing ever. Um, How many of you have had this conversation? Okay, that sounds great. When can we schedule your inquiry? Would uh, this day work? No? Um, What about this one? No, okay. Uh, How about this day? This time? What, what, uh, What? So much time wasted. How many emails does it take to schedule a meeting? A lot. It's really annoying. So here's what I prefer. Use an app that's already synced to your calendar so it knows when you're busy, when you're available. You say when you want to take meetings. So it could be Tuesdays between 7 and 3 or it could be Wednesdays between 8 and 10. That's it. Now you send a link of that option to the client and say, hey, Use this to see when you, your availability matches mine. They go click on the link. They look through and say, oh, hey, look, Mike is available between 8 and 10 on Tuesday. So am I. Let's book it. Time saved. Done. Do it. Uh, there's a couple of apps for this, namely um, Acuity and Calendly, I think are the two most popular ones. Uh, I've used both. Um, I think Acuity's got a couple more features than Calendly, Calendly does, but they're both fantastic. And then if you have um, like an automated CRM software like Dubsado, a scheduler is included with that software, which is really handy. But again, these are really nice because it automatically syncs to your calendars. You can say what days and what times you want to be available to meet with your clients. And um, and then it's just up to them to pick out when they want to meet based on their availability. So like if you do say, okay, I'm available from 10 to 3, but, you know, someone already scheduled something from like 1 to 2, then when that client, that other client sees your scheduler, they'll say, okay, Mike's available from like, you know, 10 to 1 and then 2 to 3, that 1 to 2 time is blocked off. Okay. It's really handy. Next thing, template emails and documents. <sighs> Stop typing the same thank you for inquiring email over and 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 over again. There's no need. It's the same thing every single time. It doesn't change. Why are you retyping it? You don't have to retype it. If it's the same thing every single time, make it a template. Okay. This goes for documents as well. Okay, contracts, proposals, thank you for inquiring, like, let's schedule something. These can all be templates, okay? You don't have to retype it every single time because that's a waste of five to ten minutes and the content doesn't change. Speed it up. Um, The way you can help do this is you can either have a notes app, uh, Evernote, one of those. You can have a Word document. That's like, you know, okay, um, here's the template for email inquiries. Here's the template for sending out contracts. Here's the template for asking for an invoice payment. Um, And then all you have to do is just go copy paste into your email and then say like fill in client name and then send. Like it's easy. Um, Some other things to help with this are you can do keyboard shortcuts. So like on my Mac, I can go into the settings and I can say, okay, when I press command shift I, um, it'll automatically type my entire inquiry email, okay? Very, very handy. Uh, You can also do, what I did for a while was I had, instead of having email signatures just for like, you know, my photography email, my engineering email, I actually had under my photography one, like my best photography, inquiry response one, inquiry response two, inquiry response three. So like the signatures were the template emails, okay? So I would just pick which signature, which was actually which template. So it worked out really nicely. Um, so there, there's a lot of ways 
to have this work for you. But regardless of how you copy paste it into your actual like system, whether it be documents or emails, if it's something that you repeat and you redo every single time for every single client and the language really doesn't change, like 90% doesn't change, make it a template. Okay. Next, invest in a CRM software. Okay. This could be Dubsado, 17 Hats, HoneyBook, Trello, Asana. Some are paid, some are free. Uh, Trello and Asana are freemium. They're free. You can use them completely. And then there are options for other power-ups and connections and features that you pay for. Um, Dubsado, 17 Hats, HoneyBook, all paid. Um, these are really, really fantastic. Um, CRM stands for Client Relation Management Software. Um, and the reason these are so good is because it's essentially a centralized database of client communications and data. Um, so instead of me keeping track of like where a client is at various points in their process for you know the job and me looking on different different places for it, it's all just right there and it's very graphical. So you can very easily see where everything is. Um, you can track multiple client workflows and milestones. So like I know when client A for a headshot is still waiting on their contract, whereas client B is in the editing portion of the workflow and I owe them pictures versus client C, I'm waiting on them to give me details for their wedding album. Like it's just, it's very graphical. It's all right there in front of you. So it's easy to keep track of these things. Um, the other thing that's nice about, especially the paid CRMs is that you can use template documents and emails. So you have a database of, you know, Inquiry email one, inquiry email two, you know, uh, thank you, let's schedule, here's your contract, here's the wedding proposal, um, those kind of things. And you can automatically just be like, yes, search for this, here it is, boom, send it, done, um, which is really handy. And then the other thing that's nice is that you can create automated workflows that move your clients through the process with minimal input from you. So what that looks like, whew, man, I talked really fast for that one. Okay. So what this looks like is I know for all my clients that inquire for photography, let's take headshots, for example, I've got, as soon as they inquire through my website, it's sends an email. Hey, thank you so much for scheduling. I really appreciate, I'm sorry. Thank you for inquiring. I really appreciate you, you know, sending an email. I want to reach out as soon as I possibly can. Um, here's a link to my scheduler so we can schedule your consultation meeting, right? Does that automatically. As soon as that happens, I then have another workflow trigger that's a follow-up sequence. So if they don't respond to that email within two days, it's a, hey, did you get my email? And then in five days, it's, hey, you know, is everything okay? Do you have any questions? And then a couple days after that, it's, hey, you know, are you still looking for a photographer? Hey, are you alive? Hey, did you fall asleep? Hey, what's going on? Like, not that paranoid, but like you get the idea. It's a follow-up sequence of emails to make sure like they saw your stuff, they're still interested. But while that happens, I've got the actual like lead capture workflow. So where we went from, setting that link for the scheduler that we already have, and it just continues on to here, which is, okay, you know, um, once I've got it to do, say, hey, confirm that they scheduled their appointment, and then once they do that, hey, send out a questionnaire to them that asks, can I get some more details about your session so that I'm more prepared for your client consultation meeting, so it's a more productive meeting. That goes out automatically. So then after the consultation is done, I have an email that goes out automatically a couple hours after the consultation saying, thank you for meeting with me. It was a pleasure meeting you, la, 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 la. Um, and then like I'll have an item that says, hey, build a proposal for this client. Build a proposal, send it out, automatically goes. As soon as they fill out the proposal, they automatically get sent to contract. As soon as the contract is signed, I get an email telling me to countersign it. As soon as I countersign it, they automatically get an email asking for a 25% deposit. A lot of this happens automatically. I have minimal input other than showing up for the consultation, reviewing that one questionnaire so I have better questions during the consultation, and then countersigning the contract. All of that happened, and I only had to do three things. Okay? Best day for me ever was I implemented Dubsado um, and then, like, did all my workflows. Three months later, I'm hanging out with some buddies. We're doing game night, and I get four emails within five minutes of each other. New lead, new lead, new lead, new lead. Hour later, consult scheduled, consult scheduled, consult scheduled, consult scheduled, all while drinking a beer. That's awesome. Okay. 
oh, by the way, you get more free time to focus on other activities. That's the really beautiful part. By automating all these mundane tasks that really don't require you to be in the moment to actually do the thing, it gives you time to work on marketing, to do editing, to do things that require that actually require personal human touch. Okay? These save you a lot of time. I highly recommend them. Um, if you're not sure, start out with Trello or Asana and do them. They're a manual version of a CRM software, but you'll get a taste for it and you'll see how they help you later on. Okay. Next delegation, hire a contractor or a virtual assistant. Okay. Do it. And here's why there are things you can outsource without affecting your business. Okay. Yes, you can. And also you are not the best at everything. Get an expert to knock out those activities for you, okay? The amount of years that I wasted trying to copyright for my website on my own, trying to do the language properly, versus the $1,000 I eventually spent on an actual expert copywriter to do it for me, oh my gosh, because as soon as she finished, what a difference in the clients I started getting. Like, higher paying clients, they were more the people I wanted to work with, all this amazing thing. Like, if I just spent the $1,000 first, what a difference, okay? I would be leagues ahead of where I am right now, okay? You can outsource these things, and you have to recognize that it's sometimes better to leverage experts, okay? I'm not saying, like, like if someone's building your website, have an idea of how it works, what they're doing, so that you can make tweaks after the fact. Try and learn so you know how it works, but let them do the heavy lifting. Make Let them do the actual work let them be the expert okay and do the job it will pay off dividends and it will make you more successful long term right think of these as investments and then otherwise you know hiring a contractor or a virtual assistant this is you know just helping you get through the day-to-day stuff okay you know if you really hate answering emails you really hate scheduling stuff with clients and you're not doing a CRM that has a scheduler built in hire a VA just do things to help you alleviate your time to get things set up okay if you don't want to like handle your flight and travel information, get a VA to do it. Okay, just tell them your preferences. They do it. It's done. And you can still work on the other thing. And like the time and money you save from not doing it yourself is worth the money you pay your you know contractor, expert, virtual assistant, because now you're getting more money from leads and actual jobs. Okay. And that's what this really comes down to. You have to ask yourself, is the time I gain to get more business, satisfy my clients, and have life outside the office worth the money of delegating out the work. Okay, that's the equation. That's what you have to think about. Again, this is going down to values. If you really value time with your family, find a way to delegate activities so that you get that time. Okay. Next, block scheduling. Mm, My thing. No, it's not. I learned it from a couple other people, but nobody ever does this. So it's going to be my thing today. All right. So block scheduling. This is taking similar tasks and performing them in chunks. Okay. This is the thing that I started to allude to very lightly with um, the end of my multitasking spiel, which was, you know, doing things sequentially in order um, is block scheduling. And this is really getting the maximum efficiency out of your hours and tasks Um, and the other benefit is that it helps you tackle big or intimidating items. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you what my calendar looked like last week. Okay. So here we are. You can see I've got it broken down into approximate timeframes and approximate dates. First thing you'll notice, I don't spend a lot of time on email because email is the biggest distractor on the face of the planet. I will do it, you know, when I first start the day. And when I'm closing out my day, the couple of hours in between, it really, you don't have to do it. Okay. It, I, it's too distracting. The world isn't ending. If your clients really need you that badly, tell them they can call you, but otherwise put it in an email, right? Because if it's in an email, it's not that urgent. Anyways, so what you'll notice here, so say Monday, for example, I spent the first two hours doing my accounting and business stuff. So that's like, you know, reviewing my stuff for taxes, making sure my accounts are right, moving money over into a specific savings account to a lot for my taxes that I have to pay the next quarter. So doing those kind of things. And then, you know, 
6 from 7 to 45, I did my social media posts, okay? I scheduled all of my scheduled social media posts for the month, okay? Because I sat down for an hour and a half, and I just knocked it out, okay? That's the beauty of block scheduling, all right? And that's the same thing. So, like, working on my website, updating the auto, block out some time so I can just focus on it and do it. Um, editing, same thing, like, especially editing photos, like, I have to be in the mindset so I can just hammer it out because if I've got Netflix going on on the other screen, I don't edit photos fast enough. And editing photos takes effort. It takes time. Okay, same with blogging, same with writing emails, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, Wednesday, date night, value, I want time with my girlfriend, okay? And I'm not going to let anyone change that. Boundaries. I don't let anyone schedule shoots or client consults on Wednesday evenings. Value. Making my schedule match my values okay anyways thursday did some blogging still kept doing some editing and then friday spent a little bit of time marketing and then weekend yeah um <clears throat> like that's how i scheduled my week and this is kind of like a template so this is kind of like my default how i do it but this will change okay it's not like this every single time okay it's going to change, and that's okay. The whole idea of it, though, is that I'm setting up blocks of time where I'm doing nothing ex- else except this one activity. All right? So let's go into how this actually works. So block scheduling, why it works. There's no switching loss. If I have a block of time to work on just one thing, I'm not losing time or mental energy going from this to that to this to that. Like, no, I'm just in the zone on one thing, okay? So you end up completing activities in bulk, right? I hate writing social media posts, especially Instagram captions, okay? The number of blog posts and videos I've watched, or blog posts I've read, videos I've watched, talking about the proper way to write an Instagram caption to like improve like, you know, interaction with your clients, all that stuff. Oh my gosh, so many hours down the drain because of that. And I still hate it, I don't enjoy it. But if you do block scheduling, it's not like I have to sit there for five minutes stare at the ceiling, go, what the F am I going to write for this one? Come up with something, not really be happy, and then have to move on to something else. What you end up doing is you start writing the one. Okay, not really the best. Da, 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 da. Next one. Okay, yeah, I'm kind of going to hang this. It's a little bit better. Yeah, I'm doing really good with this. This is great. Last one. Dude, I'm the Instagram caption master. I got this. Boom. You just get into a flow. You get into it, and you keep doing it, right? You get into a groove. Okay? The groove. The groove. Emperor's New Groove. I'm a Disney Pixar fan. Anyways, so you get into a groove, right? You get into the zone and you can just really hammer stuff out, okay? There's this thing called a flow state um, where you kind of get into like this weird higher level of thinking and you just like totally lock in and you do the thing. It's really powerful. Your efficiency increases, your productivity increases, and the level at which you think also increases. So there's real benefits to just locking in on one series of activities that are like and just knocking them out, okay? And I kind of alluded to this with the Instagram joke bit that I just did, is that you build confidence as you go, right? Because you keep doing it, you keep working at it, it really helps. And then, you know, the other thing is that you maintain a singular mindset, right? You're just, because you're focusing on the one thing, your brain isn't going a million different directions, you're not going back and forth, you don't have switching loss, you're just, I am working on the thing, now, today, I am present, I am clear, I'm here, it really makes a difference, okay? Here are some key points, though. If you can't dedicate at least an hour, it's not worth starting. Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay, sidebar. If you're doing emails, those take like 5, 10 minutes. That's not a big deal. This doesn't really apply. Um, other things, yeah, you can maybe do 30 minutes. It, it really depends on what you need to do the thing. Uh, I know with my engineering job, most of my tasks take a minimum of an hour if it's a true engineering job, whether it be working on a document, working on a CAD model, whatever it is. Like, if it's not email and just office chat, I need an hour to dedicate to it at minimum. So, like, if it's two o'clock and I finish some task, I'm about to jump in on another one that's going to require a couple hours to do, I'm going to go to my manager and say, Look, dude, it's not worth me staying to dig into this. I'm not going to get anything done. I'm going home. And he says, okay, we've established this relationship so that it's 
doable, but that's what we've done. So just be cognizant of like the time it takes to actually do things and build that into your block scheduling schedule calendar thing that. Okay. Next point. Don't split it up or interrupt. That's the whole point of this. No switching loss. No distractions. Focus on the thing. Okay? Next, you have to properly set client expectations. Okay, boundaries, schedule of deadlines, the whole nine, right? If you've got a lot of stuff on your plate, tell everyone when to expect these things honestly based on what you're doing, right? Like the previous week that I just showed you guys, I had a lot of editing work to do. So I set my client expectations based on the editing work I had to do and how much time I had to do it, right? As long as you tell your clients up front and early on what to expect, they'll be okay. And if they have an expectation that doesn't match what you're able to do, then just tell them, then maybe you guys aren't the right client for me, right? Or I'm not the right photographer for you. And, you know, I can recommend other photographers who can make your schedule or your needs. That's okay. Or you can charge a lot more money for a PETA fee. That's pain in the ass, PETA. Okay, so you have to set those client expectations properly, right? They can either pay you to do it faster or they just accept it or you say, I'm not the right, you know, creative person for you. Here's some other recommendations. That's fine. Okay, you can totally do that. So we got that. And then next, oh my gosh, the worst. Put down the phone, okay? Pet peeve, how many times do you sit in meetings or even just dinner with friends and you're just hanging out with them and you see them like the phone's right here and you just be like, yeah, nice conversation. Da, 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 da. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, that's really cool. That is so rude. That's infuriating to me. That's not being present. The same thing applies to when you're working on something. Even turning the phone over while it helps, you still have the potential to be distracted, especially if it bounces and it rumbles and it vibrates and it moves. Okay, I've been in client meetings where I have my phone face down and it danced off the table. Okay, it was just one of those days my phone blew up. Okay, put it somewhere where it will not distract you, vibration or, you know, notifications. Do not become a slave to your phone. Okay, if it's a phone call, Worth picking up, probably, because no one calls anymore, no one likes to call anymore, and if they're calling you, it's a thing. If they're emailing you or texting you, chances are I can probably wait, statistically speaking, at least. Okay? Put the phone down. All right. So, some random tips. Okay? These are just general good things to do. All right. Number one, try working off a single screen. I know, I know, I know. We love having dual monitors. It's really, really helpful. I'm currently working off them right now um, because it's telling me what's coming next so I sound coherent and intelligent and like I'm super fancy and memorized this presentation. I didn't. Try working off a single screen. It really helps you lock in and focus, okay? It eliminates your ability to put like email on the other screen, to throw Netflix on the other screen, to throw anything else that could distract you, right? If I'm editing photos and I know I have my deadlines that are coming up, I'll go to a coffee shop so that all I have is this one laptop screen and all I can focus on is just the photos I have to edit, okay? Try working off a single screen, right? Sometimes it's handy when you have your research on the other screen and you got to go back and forth. That's totally fine. But if you can work off just a single screen and reduce the other distractions, please, please, please do it, okay? Next, schedule breaks for yourself. We're not zombies we're not robots you can do it so it's like two hours on 10 minutes off whatever it is like give yourself some mental breaks um you know and it's just you know just to help your brain just like relax and redo and all that kind of stuff so like even if within your block scheduling if you want to like power through for like two hours take five minutes read a text message just let your brain just like and then jump back in go for it if you have a dog go take him out for a walk you have a kid Play with them for a little bit. Play some peekaboo. I don't know. So, like, you can do the breaks, okay? And with that, 
stand up every hour or so. Um, from my background as a biomedical engineer, you don't want to sit all day. You don't want to stand all day, right? I think the ratio is one and a half hours sitting, you should stand for a little bit. One hour standing, you should sit for a little bit. Okay, that's the rotation trade off. Um, that's why I'm a really big fan of having convertible uh, sit stand desks. Um, so if you do work from home, you can get that in um, and still be productive, still do your work. Um, so that's really helpful. Um, okay, next is exercise before you start. Um, I, because I work the full time job and I work, you know, my freelance photography gig, I'm working pretty much all day long. Um, so I like taking a break by going for an hour long walk as soon as I get home from work, right? So at 3 PM, I get home, change it to some gym clothes and I just go for an hour long walk. I do three miles. I don't look at my phone. I have some podcasts in or I'm listening to music and that's just my way of just like just releasing, getting a break, enjoying nature, getting some exercise in, getting your blood pumping, come back and then hit the ground running, doing the rest of the work. Um, obviously this is tricky in Georgia because it's 90 degrees at 7 PM in the summer. So, so I don't die and shrivel up like bacon. I'll do my walks at like 9 PM while the sun's still out. It's not fun, but in the winter it's cool. No pun intended. So highly recommend exercising before you start. And if you can exercise the very first thing in the morning if like you wake up drink some water do some breakfast and then immediately do exercise whether it be like a quick gym you know routine for 30 minutes you go for a walk you go for a run whatever it is if you do that first thing and then do your work your productivity your efficiency like the difference in how well you perform is like 10x improvement if you exercise okay i highly 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 recommend doing some exercise, doing something that gets you, you know, breathing a little heavy, you know, heart pumping before you do the work. It really, really helps get your brain in the right position and you're just, it's good for you. It's really good for you. And plus be healthy. Duh. Okay. And then one thing that I do that I really, um, highly recommend, and this helps with block scheduling and prioritizing your task is take an hour each week to plan the rest of the week. So like, you know, Monday mornings, well, not Monday mornings, Monday afternoons, well, no, Monday mornings too, because my day job, um, both of them, I will take an hour to go through, here are the things that I know have to be done this week, here's the stuff that I know is coming up the next week, what can I work on this week to do things, what it's based on my meeting time, like how am I going to organize my day so that I'm productive, you know, set up my block scheduling so I can knock out tasks, do the things, and balance everything, right? So I do that. So again, like I showed with my calendar earlier with my block scheduling, yeah, like I've got two days where I'm doing mostly or had editing blocks and I have like that block for social media. Well, I scheduled all my social media for the month in that one slot. So I don't have to schedule that again. I can fill that time with something else. So you can shift, you can modify, you can move it. Um, you can set it up however you need to, to match the work that you need to do, right? But seriously, planning the week beforehand really makes a difference. One, so you know what you got to do. <clears throat> One, so you know what you got to do that week. And two, um, it, it, you just make a plan. Because I know anytime I have a plan, I do better because there's an expectation. You have your deadlines. You know what you need to do. You can prep for it. And you've got your times you work in, right? And then finally, um, small bite-sized goals make big ones manageable, okay? Tell me if you've heard this one before. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Right? Simple as that. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. So like if you've got some really ridiculous, monstrous task like that you've never done before, say like I'm going to build an entire automated email drip sequence for wedding inquiries. There's a lot that goes into that. You're like, how do I do this? Where do I start? This, that, and the other. Like, okay, well, let's think about the small things. Let's, um, let's get an email communications, client, host, so like MailerLite, MailChimp, ConvertKit, whatever. Um, okay, got that. Then what do I want to say in these emails? What are the emails I want to draft? Okay, then let's draft the emails. Let's, okay, how often do I want to send it? Like turn it into bite-sized chunks and then you'll get it. It reduces how big something is and how intimidating it is when you turn it into small bite-sized chunks, right? Oh, and another thing. 
there's two mindsets in terms of how to approach tasks, right? You can either start with the hardest one or you can start with the easiest one, okay? There, the, way, the reason why you do one or the other is if you start with the hardest task, it's like you knock it out, awesome, it's done, I did the hard thing, the rest is smooth sailing. Flip that, you start with the easy one, it's like a small win, you start building confidence, you're like, okay, I did a little thing, I can do this, keep getting, keep going, keep going. So you have like max confidence when you get to the really hard task. It doesn't matter which way you start, I think it kind of depends on your personality. So if you're naturally cynical and like terrified of something, start with the easy task. If you're like full of confidence and you're really optimistic and you're like already gangbusters ready to tackle this task, start with the hard one and then go from there, right? It just, you know how you operate the best. Do it that way. All right, next, questions. These are points that I should have made the last time. So first thing, separating work from home. One thing that I really wanted to mention that I forgot to was that, you know, if you work at home and you're a freelancer, it's really hard to separate it because, you know, you're at home, especially if you like my one friend, she sits on her couch in the living room and she does her work there. There's something that happens in your mind where you can no longer separate work from home and you will always, you know, compile those, put them together and think about them at the same time. So that's why like my bedroom, I treat that as my place to sleep and to read. That's what I do there. Okay. I don't bring work into my bedroom. I don't watch TV in my bedroom. That is the room where I sleep. And that is the room where I read. Okay. By that association, your brain naturally just builds those connections and it'll like, so as soon as I walk into my room, like if it's in the middle of the day, I feel myself relax, like I'm getting ready for sleep. Okay. So have those proper rooms separated. And something that I picked up on that I thought was really brilliant was there's this gentleman named uh, Seth Godin, right? Brilliant, brilliant marketer. Um, he's got a podcast. He's got some classes. I think the podcast is called Akimbo, uh, A-K-I-M-B-O. Um, fantastic. He's really clever. And he's written a couple books too that I high, would highly recommend. Um, he's just got a very lateral way of thinking about marketing in a way that makes sense for me personally. But I overheard him or I was listening to an interview podcast with him once and he was talking about how he literally creates a uniform for himself for when he does work. So he does not open his type pad editor unless he has donned a uniform that signifies I am at work. To me, this was fascinating, right? Because you're essentially saying, you know, I have, I, you're, you're recreating almost like a corporate experience or a corporate work environment, but you're doing it in your own home. So you help create that delineation. So like he compared it to surgeons and bank robbers, right? Like a bank robber is not going to go into a bank and stick them up without putting on like the mask and the black clothes. No. And a surgeon's not going to be like, eh, I'm going to do surgery today. No. Like he's got to scrub up. He's got to put on the gown. He's got to put on the stuff on his face. Like there's a procedure and there's a transition before you get into work. So it not only makes better respect for your time, it respects your brain, it also respects the space where you do the work and where you have home. So I thought that was really powerful and I think it's something that people should consider doing um, for their own stuff. I know like even if I'm working at home on my photography stuff all day, I will shower, I'll get dressed, I'll put on a nice shirt because to me, I'm going to do work and I want to be a professional and that's you know how I approach it. So something to think about. The other one, and this is the question that I got way wrong um, when I did this talk, was I had somebody ask me, you know, hey, I understand block scheduling, you know, removing distractions and focusing on the thing, but what if you have a living being in the house? Like, for her, it was a dog. You know, sometimes the dog has accidents, sometimes the dog needs to go out, like, that's a switching loss. Like, how do I focus on this so I don't lose the time? And I was an idiot. I didn't think hard enough. And I said, Oh, well, are you married? Yeah. Okay. We'll get your spouse involved. Like for two hours, you know, one night say, Hey, can you watch the dog while I focus on this one thing? And that's not the right answer. That was not the right answer. Um, because that eliminates the values that, that was wrong direction of values. So the proper answer, um, for this, and it's a harder one actually, um, is you need to figure out how to delegate. If you really need 
time to focus in and lock in on something and do the thing without distractions, contemplate hiring a dog sitter, contemplate hiring a nanny. Um, I am have no doubt that a lot of freelancers, um, especially moms, work at home and part of them working from home was like, oh, hey, you work from home. That means you can watch the kid. We don't have to pay for daycare, which inherently makes a lot of sense. But again, that eliminates the separation from work and home, where now you're always working and you always got the kid with you too, or now you're always working and you have your pets with you too. You can't separate it, right? And you can't focus. So you have to ask the question of, is it worth it to have somebody come in and act as a nanny, um, a dog sitter, a pet walker? anything like that for a couple hours, you know, every day, every other day to watch the kid, to watch the pet while I do the work? Or am I okay with being slightly distracted, caring for this being and balancing it with doing the job, right? It all depends on your financial situation, the agreement you have with your, you know, significant others, your family, what you value. Because if you like really value having those, you know, kids or your pets with you, then you fight for that. Like that's what you want to have around you. But you have to recognize that you're going to give up some of your ability to focus and lock in on your activities. So that's, it's a harder answer and a harder thing to do, but it's the right one. Okay. You have to do it based on your values. If you really want to be able to have time to focus in and lock in on things, you may have to delegate out and, you know, do daycare, do a pet sitter, do a nanny, And it doesn't have to be every single day. It could be for just like two hours, three hours, one day a week, right? And that's the day you say, okay, this is the day I'm going to focus on the really difficult thing, right? You could do it that way. So it's not all or nothing. You can be in between, all right? So here's where we are. Thank you very much for sitting through all this. Um, I do appreciate, you know, everyone being here, taking the interest in time management. And I do apologize for... Not having done this the right way the first time, because I'm sure this was such a wonderful experience for everybody. Um, But anyways, thank you. Uh, Again, my name is Mike Glatzer, um, portrait photographer. You know, Mike Glatzer Photos. Here's my email. Here's my Instagram. And something I recently started was doing a Dubsado setup help. Um, I've had a number of people um, ask me for help with Dubsado, um, setting up their workflows, showing them how to use it. Um, and I've gotten great feedback doing it. So I want to start offering that help because it is something that I'm passionate about, something I'm good at. Um, and I really want to make sure that people can get automated, can delegate, can do things so that they can set up their schedule to really live the life they want to live that matches their values. So thank you very much for sitting through this with me. I really appreciate your time. Ha ha. Um, if you have any questions, shoot me an email, um, DM me on Instagram, whatever. Um, I want to help you guys. I want to make sure you have the most successful life possible based on your values, um, so that you can do the things you want to do right out of work and at work. Um, so again, I'm Mike Glatzer. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you found this informative and, uh, yeah, I'll see you guys later.